now that we've talked about the basics of time, uh, how time timing works in a uh, integrated circuit system, um, let's get into some more advanced topics, um, some of which uh, have positives and some have negatives and some have both. Um, one of those is what we call time borrowing. Um, first I'll talk about uh, how this might be in effect in a flop-based system and then in a latch-based system. So in a flop-based system, remember that your data launches out of any given flop on the rising edge of clock. And then it will go through some set of combinational logic. And it eventually must set up to the next flop that's downstream of it before the next rising edge of clock. If it arrives after the next rising of edge of clock, um, it's it got there too late. It, that data that you wanted to get in the downstream flop uh, does not get captured in that flop, um, and so in effect your your system fails. Uh, you get some sort of error. Uh, you got the wrong data. Um, you don't have what you want. Um, so you you can't allow that to happen. So um, in effect you require for every set of flops the combinational logic between flops has to be less than one cycle worth of time. Um, so you require the data to arrive there early. Because you require it to get arrive there early, you waste some amount of time. Sometimes you can time it almost exactly right, and so you use up like 99% of your cycle. Uh, but a lot of times you might only use 75% of your cycle or less than that. And so you effectively waste some some possible time that you had to do real logic. Um, so in effect, flops have hard edges. You can't really borrow time between two different stages of flops. Now in a latch-based system, uh, remember the data starts going through the latch when the latch opens on the rising edge for a phase one latch or on the falling edge for a phase two. And it can continue to pass through during the entire phase when the clock uh, causes the latch to be open. So if we look at, um, let's say, uh, in your mind picture our previous uh, timing diagram where you have a phase one latch and then one phase worth of logic and then followed by a phase two latch and another phase of logic and then a phase one latch again. Um, if after the first phase one latch, clock opens uh, the latch and data starts going through the uh, half cycle worth of logic. If that half cycle worth of logic is more than half a cycle, let's say it's 1.25 cycle or phases worth of logic, um, so 25% more than a phase worth of logic, uh, when it gets to the phase two latch, the phase two latch opens when the clock goes low or, or the phase one, phase two clock goes high. Um, and when it opens, the data isn't there yet, which is fine because it stays open for an entire phase. So when the, the data then gets there 25% into the phase two, it just goes through transparently and continues on to the next phase of logic that is following the phase two latch. And if that set of logic is a little bit more than a phase, let's say, um, then when it gets to the following phase one latch, that latch will open. The data isn't there yet, but maybe it goes 30% of the way into the following phase of logic. And it because the latch is still open, it transparently goes through, everything's fine. Now, we can't keep doing that forever um, through like, you know, if we went through another 10 phases worth of logic and you keep adding 10% of a phase, eventually you're gonna miss um, the closing edge of a latch. But if we have some phases of logic that are longer than a phase, and then let's say the, the following two phases of logic are shorter than a phase, um, then in effect we can borrow time between some phases that are a little bit longer, some phases are a little bit shorter, and overall, as long as we have the average phase um, is less than a phase of logic, we can, in effect, get less hard edges and really hard requirements on our 
timing and it gives us a little bit more flexibility in how we create, create our logic and implement our logic. So there's definitely a lot of advantages to this. Um, and so sometimes this can be a good way to go uh, in your system if you have difficulty with hard timing edges. So let's go through an example here. Um, this is similar uh, to what I was talking about um, on the previous FOIL. So if we have uh, a two-phase uh, latch system, and in this case, uh, the phase one clock and the phase two clock are aligned to each other as opposed to uh, we've previously shown where the phase one and phase two clock um, have some non-overlapping time between them. But a lot of times it's actually done, the, the phase one and phase two clock are done this way in a lot of systems because that way, instead of creating a completely new phase two clock, um, you can just take phase one clock and invert it and in order to make your phase two clock. So, um, so just to explain why the, the phase two clock in this case is, is not non-overlapping. Um, so in the uh, above for the, the row that is labeled A, we have phase one latch, phase two latch, and fa phase one latch. And it's showing that if we have the combinational logic of the phase one is longer than a phase worth of logic. So following the first phase one, we have combinational logic that causes us to go partway into the phase two. Well, the phase two clock is still open for the latch when the data gets there. And so it will just transparently go through and then it goes through, let's say one phase worth of logic. So the overall amount of logic through the two sets of combinational logic is still over a cycle because the first one was over a phase, the second one is let's say exactly a phase. So, but we go into the following phase one latch and we're, we're borrowing some time from the next cycle worth of logic. And depending on what comes, comes through in the following set of, of logic, um, that's perfectly okay, potentially. Eventually you might run into a problem if, if you keep trying to, to borrow more time and, and have more than a phase of logic for the next several phases. Um, and you can see, so, but potentially that's okay for this particular cycle. You're not gonna see a failure at this point. However, if you have something like in the B, the row in B, uh, if the output of the combinational logic, let's say fed back and you had a loop where it's feeding back to the phase one latch, if you had something like in row A, uh, you, the first time through the loop, you'd be fine. You'd be borrowing a little bit into the phase one latch the second time through, but then after you go through the second time, the third time, you'd be borrowing even more into that phase one latch because it would start getting later and later and later through that phase one latch. And eventually after maybe three or four times through the loop, you would eventually fail to, to get your result back into the phase one latch. So you can't have some sort of loop that is more than one cycle unless you only go through that loop once and you have a way of knowing that you're gonna break the loop. Uh, but eventually you're, you're going to wind up uh, failing that loop if you can do it over and over and over. Um, so that's a, an example showing that if you have something like a loop, you have to, if you borrow through one phase, you have to make sure to make up for it in the next phase. Um, so that way, when you go through the loop, each loop, um, the combination of the two phases is one cycle or less. And if that's true, um, then you're, you're guaranteed to work uh, no matter how many times you, you go through the loop. So how much time borrowing can you do depends on what type of system you're looking at. So if you have a system of two phase latches, and in this case, we're actually showing a system, the worst case is if you have no, non, some amount of non-overlap time, um, you actually get a little bit better if you have uh, f uh, a system where your phase two clock is the exact inverse of your phase one clock and they're both um, have a high time of one phase worth of logic uh, 
um, that that gives you a little bit better as far as how much time borrowing you can do because you can see um, here if you look at how much time borrowing you can do in a two-phase latch system um, the most you can do is one phase worth of additional logic so in theory you could do uh, the amount of combinational logic between two a phase one and a phase two latch could be basically a full cycle um, the phase one opens on the rising edge the phase two if you had no non overlap time would be falling at the time of the next rising edge of phase one and so you would in theory be able to get a full cycle worth of logic between two phases phase one latch and phase two latch um, but in practice um, that that half cycle worth of additional logic you can put in there is reduced by the setup time because you you still do have a setup time you need to be stable before that phase two latch closes so it's gonna the most time you can borrow would be uh, you have to subtract setup time and then if you're using a non overlapping clock um, you have an additional time um, where the phase two uh, clock is going low before the next phase one goes high um, so that is an additional um, amount of time that you have to subtract from how much you can borrow so um, the total amount of time borrowing that you can get or maximum amount would be half your cycle minus the quantity your setup time plus your t non overlap time now if you were using pulse latches instead of two phase latches uh, the most time borrowing you can get is basically the width of your pulse minus how much setup time it takes so if you had a pretty long pulse and a pretty short setup time you could get some additional time borrowing in it and it might be a, a reasonable amount um, usually you want to try and keep your your pulse width to a fairly small amount um, it just depends on how you're trying to balance the larger the pulse you use for a pulse latch the worse uh, problems you have with min delay but the larger pulse you use for a pulse latch the easier issues you have with time borrowing so you're kind of balancing getting a little bit easier time on max delay for making your min delay a lot harder um, if you use uh, larger pulses and so that's some of the trade-offs you have to use um, balancing max delay and min delay uh, depending on the type of uh, time borrowing system that you're using While time borrowing is an effect that might actually make your timing easier uh, in a lot of cases for um, determining your max delay and your max frequency, uh, clock skew on the other hand is a negative effect that makes it harder um, for both your uh, maximum frequency max delay but also for your min delay. Um, and clock skew, up until now, we've assumed uh, as we're going through all of our analysis that we have zero clock skew. Uh, what this means is uh, uh, basically we have flops and latches that are physically placed in across an area of an integrated circuit um, across a large distances between them uh, relative to nanoscale and in reality um, assuming and we've been assuming that every clock arrives at each flop and each latch at exactly the same time. In reality, there's absolute, absolutely no way that you can physically cause a clock to get to every single latch and flop in your design at the exact same time. It's just not possible um, at the scale that we're talking about uh, for the timings uh, and the, the speeds that we're talking about. And so in reality, every clock has some uncertainty in when it's arriving at any given flop or latch. And that uncertainty will increase the uncertainty of our maximum propagation delay and also increase our uncertainty of our minimum contamination delay. Um, so in effect, what we need to do is we need to add some delta to the potential propagation delay when we're calculating both max and min delay and we need to add some undelta to some delta to the minimum contamination delay when we're calculating both max and min delay uh, 
Um, this will decrease the amount of time borrowing that we would effectively be able to, to try and make use of if we're using a time borrowing system. Uh, but it also decreases, if we're not using a time borrowing system, um, it still decreases the total amount of available cycle time that we will we'll be able to calculate for our max frequency. And similarly, it decreases uh, or increases kind of the amount of delay that we might expect uh, when we're calculating our min delay as well. Um, so in on both sides, we need to have some sort of accounting for a clock skew as we're doing our calculations to make sure that uh, we put in some additional delay for min delay or we leave some additional um, extra margin for max delay uh, in our combinational logic delay uh, as we're doing um, those calculations as well. So let's go through an example of the skew calculations for both max and min delay um, for a flop based design. So in the upper part of the graph on the or the diagram on the right, we have a flop based design. Um, we're showing here a clock waveform where the the dark clock waveform is the latest edge of the clock that can ever go through any clock in the design. And then we have some lighter uh, edges of clock that are earlier than the dark waveform. And th they're showing potential clock timing that could go to other clocks in the design that are our earliest um, potential clocks um, in the design. Um, or at least earliest potential clocks that can go to F1 and F2 in this case. So in this case, if we're trying to time, okay, what's the, the maximum time that we can take in our, our combinational lo logic? Uh, for the max delay, the worst case maximum time that we can go is we want the initial data to be clocked off of the latest clock edge. So we're clocking at F1 that clock is coming from the latest clock edge. It goes through a propagation delay from clock to out in the flop, and then it goes through a propagation delay of the combinational logic. And then we have to do the setup time to the clock coming to F2. Well, the worst case setup time will be to the earliest potential clock that can go to F2. And so that earliest clock has a skew time, T skew, that is that much earlier than the initial clock that we started with. And so we basically have the cycle time minus the sequencing overhead. And the sequencing overhead is what we previously had talked about. It's the contamination delay through the first flop the setup time to the second flop, but then we have this additional term of T skew, which is your clock skew, um, that needs to be added to your sequencing overhead, and that removes um, a little bit of additional time from the, the full cycle that you normally would have for your combinational logic. Um, so this reduces the amount of time that you have for your max delay um, in the amount of combinational logic that you're allowed to be uh, have in your cycle. Now looking at the bottom part of the diagram, uh, we have the, the diagram for how you would calculate min delay. So min delay, you don't want to accidentally get through the combinational logic too early and have something go through flop one and flop two both on the same, at the exact same cycle, the exact same rising clock edge. So in this case, um, the earliest that something can go through flop one is if we take the earliest edge of that rising edge of the clock. So um, we now look at the earliest edge of the uh, rising edge and then we have a contam contamination delay which is the the quickest we can go through flop one. So we have that contamination delay through flop one then we have the contamination delay through the combination logic, which is the earliest and quickest we can get through the combination, combinational logic. And that can get 
can that get to the input of flop two before the clock there uh, rises? And in that case, um, we're concerned with the latest clock that can get to clock two, um, because if we have a later clock to clock two, or to flop two, um, we can potentially get the same data going through flop one and on the same edge of clock going through flop two because the flop two clock is later than the flop, flop one clock. Um, and then of course there's a certain hold time uh, that, that gets added to this. So in this particular case we need the combinational logic to be enough delay so it needs to be greater than the hold time minus the combinational uh, uh, contam contamination delay through the flop one, but plus the skew time. So you need some additional amount of time through your con combinational logic to make up for the fact that you have this clock skew in there, where clock to flop two is later than the clock to flop one. Now, as to how skew affects the timing that we've been talking about previously for latches, um, there's a whole lot of information on this slide uh, that would take a long time to go through. Um, so rather than trying to spend 10 to 15 minutes just on this slide, I'd suggest that you pause on this slide, write down these equations, go back, compare to the equations that we previously had, for max delay and min delay for two-phase latches and time borrowing for two-phase latches and of course max min delay and time borrowing for um, pulse latches and go through the uh, logic yourself to see how these compare. Um, as you can see uh, there is a new t-skew parameter in the various different functions so uh, do this um, on your own offline and uh, I suggest that you know it'd be good to understand it um, at a minimum at least make sure that you have these equations recorded somewhere so that you know how when skew is put into uh, these equations and how it affects your max delay, min delay, and time borrowing at the very least um, do so um, everyone uh, go back and spend some time uh, looking at that, uh, making sure you can do a similar sort of analysis as we just did in the previous foil uh, with flops and skew. So just a quick comment um, at this point about two-phase clocking uh, and how it relates to um, our setup and hold time stuff. So. Uh, in the case that setup times are violated, if we have two-phase clocking, uh, we can just reduce our clock speed, uh, increase our period of our clock, and everything uh, looks good, everything works. Um, one, so that's for max delays, uh, setup time. For min delays, also called hold times, if you have violations of hold times, uh, the chip will fail at any speed. You can put in whatever frequency clock you want, it's still going to fail because keep keep in mind this is when you have a single edge of the clock is causing a problem because between two flops that single edge of the clock causes a data to go through two successive flops or two successive latches when it shouldn't have and it doesn't matter what speed you're running at a single edge of the clock is always a single edge of the clock so a comment that in this class working chips, well this isn't true of just in this class, in general um, in anything that you're working on working chips are most important. Um, but in this class one of the issues is uh, we don't really have tools to analyze clock skew. In um, high-end designs in the industry uh, they have a lot of tools that they use. One of those tools is something that uh, simulates the clock tree the same as it does the data tree and it knows um, most of those tools try to be very precise on exactly when each clock is getting to each flop and latch as well as how much skew is on each clock 
So um, basically one way in this class to make sure that we don't have failures and that we have working ships is instead of just having a single clock going through the entire design, uh, an easy way to guarantee that your hold times are going to be met is to use um, two-phase latches with fairly large no non-overlap times. Um, so if you decide to use that in your designs, um, it's a phase one and phase two clock. Uh, we call these clocks phase one and phase two clock as opposed to uh, usually if you're not using a two-phase clocking, you'll use a phase one and phase one bar is what you might call it. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to make a quick comment about that and uh, keep that in mind as you're designing circuits in the future for this class. So continuing on with uh, from the previous uh, foil when we were talking about uh, two-phase clocking, um, below here I'm showing if you're using two-phase clocking you can do a safe flip-flop design um, so like in past years if you used uh, flip-flop with non-overlapping clocks you can see in the uh, circuit below the slave latch has a phase one and a phase one bar going to each of the uh, pass gate and uh, tri-state feedback elements whereas the master has a phase two and a phase two bar going to its pass gate and tri-state feedback elements. Um, so this makes a much safer design if you don't have good clock simulation. Um, the problem is it's slower and the non-overlap time actually adds to your setup time, but you don't run into any hold time problems. Um, so uh, that's a safer design, but the the downsides um, are typically something that it's not used in industry. In industry, we basically use a lot of tools that are much better timing analyzers. You know where your clocks are and what they're doing. And if you, and you also have uh, timing analyzers that will tell you uh, right away whether you have problems with min delays. And so if you have um, some sort of min delay or hold time issue, um, you can just add additional delay to the data signal before it gets to the flopper latch. And usually it's not too hard to fix uh, hold time issues um, in practice on, on your chips. Now this is showing, okay, let's say you want to determine do I have a max delay in my circuit, I, I have some places where I know there's a lot of logic in a given combinational delay uh, phrase or cycle, um, is this going to cause a problem at the frequency I want to run at? Um, here's an idea that uh, some people have used in the past called adaptive sequencing, where in effect you, instead of just having your data go to a single flop, um, that then sends its output onto some additional logic. Let's say you, you know that there's a certain flop that um, the, the logic leading up to that flop had a lot of uh, sequential elements in it, um, is one of your longest paths. Um, at least you predict it's one of your longest paths. What you can do is say, let's take that data, send it into two different flops, one that's a little bit slower than the other or has a little bit uh, longer setup time into this flop. Um, so if you do this, so this example shown in the diagram here, let's say the output of the flop that's shown in X there is a little bit slower than the one for D to Q. Um, so we have it, some data coming in and it goes into the first edge of the, uh, in this case it looks like it's a pulse latch type design uh, rather than flop. So it goes into the first one and both Q and X both capture it because the data was there before the pulse latch open. But when we get to the next cycle, the data gets there a little bit later and so Q1 winds up capturing it, but X doesn't because X is, like I said, a little bit slower. Um, 
and then we do an XOR between Q and X. Um, in other words, we detect whether uh, Q and X are both one or both zero. If they're ever a different value than each other, then we know that our cycle was a little bit too fast and we were able to capture a new value in Q, but the X value didn't get caught. And so we out, output from that XOR an error value. And this is a way of detecting if we start trying to run the frequency a little bit faster, a little bit faster, we can find out what frequency um, eventually causes an error to come out. Um, so while it's a way of potentially measuring errors um, and, and measuring what your frequency of operation is at different voltages, different temperatures, different process variations, etc., can cause your circuit to run faster or slower. Um, in practice, I've personally never seen this done. Um, there's other ways of putting uh, error detection and frequency uh, measurement techniques that um, this seems like a high overhead to add an additional uh, latch into your design that has to be clocked as well as an error measuring thing. Um, it, it's just not probably my preference, um, but I just wanted to introduce it as one possible way you might see this adaptive sequencing um, mentioned in the book, and so I figured I'd uh, cover um, at least the basics of what's going on here. So in summary, uh, just to summarize our sequential um, analysis here, um, we have three different types of uh, sequential um, designs that we've gone through. First one is flip-flops. These are in general the easiest to use. They're supported by all tools and Usually it's also the easiest to understand. You have one cycle of logic between two flip-flops. Um, calculating your max delays and your min delays are, are relatively easy. And um, in addition to supported by the timing tools, um, it's also the, the easiest, most supported for running if you run synthesis tools where it synthesizes your logic automatically. Um, those tools also understand uh, uh, one cycle worth of logic between any two flops, um, the easiest as well. Um, then of course we talked about uh, transparent two-phase latch design. Uh, this has uh, benefits to it in that it allows a lot more skew tolerance. It allows time borrowing between phases and so it can make it a lot easier for um, a human sometimes to actually uh, design their logic across multiple phases and make sure um, to have some tolerance they can put a little bit more logic where it makes sense and be able to uh, have um, a timing tolerant design and design their logic um, a little bit heavier in some areas and lighter in other areas and make up for it overall over multiple phases. Um, the issues with uh, the two-phase tra transparent latch is sometimes understanding if you put too much time borrowing and too many uh, transparent stages in a row. Um, I've worked on projects in the past where we would have uh, some um, paths that would go through maybe 10, 20 phases worth of logic transparently and trying to understand a uh, timing report that has 20 phases worth of logic before you see a failure and then figuring out where to put your fixes in um, can be quite difficult. Um, and then on top of that, we've even seen sometimes where uh, at the end of like 10, 15 phases, it will loop back to the input and you will wind up seeing three loops through those phases of logic before you finally see a failure. And that can be a real nightmare trying to figure out what's the problem and where to fix it. Um, so uh, that's some of the downsides of creating too much of transparent latch design. And then finally, uh, we looked at pulse latches. Um, this pulse latches because they're uh, small and have uh, a short delay through them can be the fastest uh, 
design the least amount of overhead um, of propagation delay through them. And they'll give you some benefit of skew tolerance and time borrowing, um, not quite as much as the two-phase latch, but uh, they tend to give you a hold time risk um, that can be difficult to fix in some cases. Below, I would recommend um, taking a snapshot or uh, trying to print out or record um, the information in the table below, uh, basically just telling you what the equations are for your sequencing overhead of the three different designs and the minimum logic delay uh, that you're allowed uh, through um, your combinational logic as well as uh, your equation for time borrowing uh, that's allowed for each of the different designs. So you have uh, that to use in the future as we go through the rest of this course. So that's it for uh, this section, uh, this week worth of um, lectures, and uh, talk to you again next week.